Hi again, it's Adrian here from SoFeast, joined by our CEO, Renaud. Renaud, hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so what are we talking about today? Yeah, well, this is episode 135. And because we are kind of like halfway through November 2022, it's time to talk Chinese New Year. And mm. Chinese New Year is coming up actually pretty soon now. It's it's motoring towards us on the horizon. And we do kind of usually talk and write about Chinese New Year and preparing for it every year because it's just so important to mm. consider it and its impact and get ready for it. And because of where we are now, and it's coming up on January the 22nd, 2023, it's time to be preparing, if not already be prepared, right? Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> if if you're working with Chinese manufacturing companies you're just getting over the october 1st uh break which was basically yeah. more of a, like a one week break uh and then ouch we're already talking about the next big break which changes yep. year and after that is early may and and so on and so forth well chinese new year the official new year this uh this time is early it's 22nd of january 2023 is that correct Yes, it is. Yeah, that is early. Yeah, that is. Yeah, that, that's that's early. It's yeah, seldom comes earlier than that. So, hmm. yeah, basically, what it means is that if you've got orders to place for shipment be- before Chinese New Year, in many cases, it's already too late. Okay, hmm. so I guess everybody's, you know, if you work a lot with with China on manufacturing topics, I mean, you can't forget about CNY. Uh, it's a Chinese New Year, so you you know what what, what what's coming, right? But this is a bit of a, um, a reminder that maybe you need to to uh, give it a little bit more thought. You know what to plan yeah. for, and one of the things is which of your suppliers is going to be very busy during this period because it's not it's not every supplier. Mm. Right. Uh, some suppliers actually are not busy at all at that time. Like you go to a toy factory, uh, you know, they might be somewhat busy around January and then like it's kind of dead until until May, maybe, where they start some productions for the, you know, Christmas next, uh, you know, end, end of the year. So mm. it, it's highly variable. Now there's other factories that are quite busy and it's, since they don't really have good planning systems, they are already always overcommitted, and there's always some orders that were due in December, pushed to January. Oh yeah, yeah, we try the best we can and try to, and then boom, it's pushed after CNY, and then you know people go on a holiday, they come back, and their head is you know somewhere else, and they kind of forget the details, and then they start to work on it. You know, in February slowly. Because they have new staff and so, on, and then they ship it in March. Well, right there, you you gotta you know you get it bumped from December to March, right? So, you, with that kind of supplier, you don't want to target a shipment in December, right? You want to target a, a shipment now, basically, uh, because after that, who knows what can happen? If you're not their number one customer, um, well, anything could happen, right? Mm. And if you have contracts that assign some penalties for late shipments and so on, it might actually work against you. It might put them in a situation where they lose so much money that they prefer actually just to drop the order. <laughs> uh, but, you know, who who sent them a deposit, right? So actually you need to get back to them and negotiate because you, you are hooked more than they are maybe, uh, especially if the, the components and materials that they, they purchased can be reused very easily for their other products or their other customers, right? So actually, they're mm. not really out any money. So you, you you need to be aware, basically, of all these um, all these factors, right? And it's not just in China, by the way. I mean, it's, uh, just a couple of days ago, when was that? Well, as the, at the time of the recording of this podcast, we published something about uh, kind of a crazy story in Bangladesh, but it's actually not uncommon in Bangladesh. For factories to be so overcommitted that they ship 
way way later than um than than their their customer expects so it's really it's not just china right but chinese new year is just having such an impact on the supply chains here you know with all the factories basically taking at least two weeks off uh, but if they are not exporting factories if they're making components for other factories in china they might take three weeks off they might take more uh, longer who knows and also that's the time when some um, <laughs> some sneaky factory owners collect as much as they can withhold payments to their suppliers close the factory gates and just disappear in the nature hmm. this is just um it's not just chinese you know sometimes it's taiwanese and then they fly back to the to taiwan or whatever and they, they never fly back to china right uh, it, it's a little bit everywhere uh there is always a little bit of this risk and it's very hard for foreign buyers to see that coming but really a big warning uh, that some buyers learn really the, the the hard way is don't send a deposit before CNY for a production after CNY or a shipment after CNY. You got to be on top of things. You got to see and you, you got to really be careful because you send money, you're kind of giving them the incentive, especially if it's a lot of money, to say, okay, this year is the year where I just take the cash and run. Okay, so they're not going to buy the the components they're just going to keep the cash and and it's just tempting and, and they run right mm. the the business environment has not been great for a lot of manufacturers especially in uh, relatively low value added types of industries you know like in, in garments gift and premium and so on it is it's been tough for a lot of them and they might have accumulated debt for years and even if you have a lawyer do a lot of data gathering, and in some cities it's possible to see actually the the, the balance sheet of the, the manufacturer. Well, number one is it, you know, do they only have that company? Maybe they run, run their business on three or four different companies. That's actually quite common <laughs> in China. So which which company are you are you targeting? You know, maybe you look at one of them that has a relatively healthy balance sheet, but some others. A deep in uh, in in debt, so that that's one thing. But also, mm. you know, how much do they own? Do, do they owe their 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 suppliers? That is often not on the balance sheet, or maybe they they don't own owe it to their suppliers, but they owe it to some other parties somewhere. You know, uh, in 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 China, you can borrow money at relatively high interest, of course. From people who will cut your fingers if you don't pay them back quickly, you know this kind of <laughs> people. So there's there's all kinds of things like that, and that's also one of the reasons why these these factory buses disappear suddenly, uh, because they have to they have to get away from the government, of course, and all the employees who are going to be pissed because probably they did not get their salaries and their social insurance and everything paid. But most of all, if they're running away from from these. Um, sort of the local mafia, if you want, right? Mm. Uh, so that's the situation that's a big warning that is worth repeating sort of every year. Apart from that, I mean, how much inventory do you have, right? Uh, can you um, can you afford to go into January and February with relative low in, relatively low amount of inventory? Uh, do you know exactly when you're going to get your next batch of, uh, of of the key products that you need to to keep using and delivering to your own customers right hmm. so a lot of companies pay a bit more get a bit more ca- a bit more inventory sorry even if it's just on a boat coming to them you know at least they they, they know it's coming they know it they can count on it whereas everything manufacturing wise is a little bit more fleeting but again it really depends on the manufacturers some manufacturers are dependable. When I look in in, in our manufacturing subsidiary, Agilian, um, everything is planned carefully. The, the project managers are responsible for working out the details with all the component suppliers and, you know, giving a clear plan to the customers. And um, 
there's always ways to address uh, priorities. I mean, there was a, a year where we had a, a few workers keep working all throughout. And uh, our chief operation officer, Fabien, was working there every day, actually mm. even on the production line to, to get it going because there was so much pressure from uh, from our main customer at that time, right? And it was not because we were screwed up or anything, but they were kind of begging us, you know, please, you know, we need to deliver. And uh, okay, well, next year you'll be more careful with the forecast. <laughs> But okay, let's try to uh, to do everything in our power, right? So sometimes you can expect a little bit of that, uh, mm. but you you can't pull on that cord. I mean, you can. This is definitely not something we would ever promise a customer, uh, because it's just crazy. You can't do that. It's not sustainable. So, uh, but what I'm saying is that it's not every manufacturing company that basically completely fails to to plan and that allows. An amazing amount of surprises to uh, to creep up, right? Uh, mm-hmm. it, it is some of the suppliers. So if your suppliers usually are messing up with the delivery times and everything, you can expect that you know to the power of ten at, at, at CNY, basically. Let's say it this way, <laughs> right? Another thing I think we should mention is that people in China in manufacturing are just tired. They are just really tired. So this flares up of of, of COVID here mm-hmm. and there, and you never really know how the local government is going to react. And as I'm recalling this November 10th, well, yesterday there were a bunch of cases recorded in, in, in Guangzhou. So now yeah. everybody in Guangdong is thinking, ouch, you know, what is that? Like 600 cases in Guangzhou suddenly and mm. thousands of um, other cases uh, asymptomatic. You know, they mm. kind of counted separately. I still don't understand why. But anyway, yeah. um, it, it is the symptom of a big problem and um, and the sign of a lot of restrictions to come. But nobody really knows mm. how, when, how much, you know, and where is it going to extend? Is it going to be also in um, in Dongguan, in Shenzhen, in, in Foshan? Mm. Or, you know, where, where is it going to, right? Uh, Guangzhou is 19 million people. And uh, if you if you don't know about Guangzhou, it's the capital of, of Guangdong, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though Shenzhen maybe gets more press uh, a lot of the time. Mm. But, uh, yeah, they've, they're doing mass testing and they are suggesting, you know, they could be in for a citywide lockdown, such as, that which happened in in Shanghai, and that was, you mm. know, earlier this year in in the sort of middle of the year, wasn't it? And that was two months of lockdown. So I mean, uh, Guangzhou more, also also yeah, a huge, <laughs> okay. Yes. So uh, a, also a huge manufacturing hub. So I mean, if if mm. that gets locked down for two or three months, then what's going to happen? Right. Exactly. Exactly. So and usually, yeah, it would probably not be just Guangzhou because Guangzhou is. Hyper connected into yeah. um, Foshan, Zhongshan, Dongguan, Shenzhen, Huizhou. I mean, uh, you know, and yep. all, all Jiaoqing and so on. So everybody's sort of bracing of what, what was going to happen, and it it's been you know nearly three years now of mm. that that situation, and you know after the the twenties Congress, well, uh, we can see that. It's probably not about to 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 end anytime soon, mm. um, and it comes after. Let me see. Power cuts were a big thing at one point, not so long ago. Yeah, um, about a year uh, ago, last I think. Year, yeah, roughly like thirteen months ago, uh, or fourteen months ago. Mm. Let me see what else. Like super high heat uh, this mm. this summer for very prolonged periods of time. Uh, all kinds of supply chain issues, of course, the containers being extremely expensive and people keeping a lot of stock in warehouses and waiting for the price to come down, all kinds of things like that. Mm. Of course, electronic components, seriously uh, hard to find some of them anyway, and sometimes 20 times more expensive than uh, than they should and you know other than usual, I should say. And uh, lead times of six months, Eight months. I mean, it's, um, for people in that industry, it's been really, uh, really tough. Especially if they were not not so lucky and they 
you know, they pick the wrong MCU or, or whatever, the, the wrong active components, and they, they can't really um, change their design easily. Uh, it's, it's been tough. Um, mm. You know, people can really travel. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And of course, the political tensions, which have gone up one or two notches this year, seriously. Mm. Uh, and um, I mean, for people who are kind of curious, just listen to the episode on Mexico with Andrew Huppert um, that we um, we recorded a few months back. And mm -hmm. he really, uh, well, uh, he predicted the Republicans would, would take Congress and everything in, 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 in the U.S. that they would get extremely tough on China. Well, this, uh, um, from the, the results in the midterm elections, this doesn't seem to be the case. So there's a little bit of hope here. <laughs> that things are not going to go bad as fast as some people predicted, uh, but still, I mean, the trend, the trend is not going to reverse. Mm. So, uh, I mean, it, who, the, yeah, there's a negative China trend in the West, regardless oh. of of who's in office. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, they've the, the, the president is a is a Democrat, but it's not like Biden is very pro China. Oh no, but. What really matters is the public opinions. I mean, look, yeah. in Australia, after, um, what was it? Um, all kinds of allegations, or actually it was not just allegations, they kind of had a lot of evidence, it seems, of uh, Chinese interference into Australian politics. Uh, mm. They they went really fast from, um, uh, you know, eh, let's be kind of friends with everybody, China and the US the same, you know, all the way to, hey, if China takes over, Southeast Asia, like we, you know, we 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 we're not going to be able to have any kind of independence. We can't let that happen, you know. Which is the current um, uh, current um, uh, tone that uh, yeah. politicians in Canberra are having these days, and the, the, you know, the public opinion went f against China pretty fast, uh, mm. and it's it's going uh, it's getting harsher on China including in places like Germany, uh, France, you know, countries that are sort of trying to avoid getting caught in, in all the anti-China uh, sentiment. Uh, at least yeah. the politicians are trying not to, um, uh, not, not, not to get into that. Well, public opinion is turning. So this is a, this is a mega trend. So anyway, mm. to get back to, um, to the general feeling of just being tired of, all these difficulties, right? Uh, and and Chinese suppliers trying to invest out of China, of course, in uh, in in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Burma, not so much with the, the unrest these days. Um, yes, and and actually more and more in um, Mexico, like there's a special economic zone or something in in uh, Monterrey, which mm -hmm. is. Um, it's going to attract uh, more and more Chinese investment, it seems. So mm. Chinese suppliers are trying to 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 ramp up operations there, but you know it's it's hard for them to send their uh, key staff, key engineers, key managers there to set things up and train the people there to do things uh, on uh, how to do it with with all the well the restrictions to to traveling. So. They they also can go as fast as they would like, and this mm -hmm. is getting their customers, especially their American customers or Australian customers or UK customers, uh, really nervous. You know, oh, all of our eggs are still in the China basket. So that, that's the um, that, that's a lot of the feeling that I that I hear. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, look at what happened again this past week in uh, in well in Zhengzhou in Henan province, which is sort of in central China, is the most most um, populated province of China, I believe, in Hunan. Oh. That's where um, Foxconn have their huge uh, manufacturing facility. Mm. They used to have their their largest manufacturing facility in Shenzhen. Uh, mm. It's still pretty large, just like a city within the city. Uh, I mean, on the highway, they have a, an exit. You've seen it probably. Uh, it's just okay. This yes. is Foxconn. Foxconn yeah. exit. Yeah, uh, it's huge, uh, but in Zhengzhou, it's even bigger. Wow. They say they have something like two hundred to three hundred thousand people there, uh, except that 
well, they can't really operate in a fully um, closed bubble mode, and they, they have some COVID cases. And then when you have COVID cases like this with people sleeping in a dorm, you know, maybe 12 people in the same dorm and, and working side by side on assembly lines and so on, how can you avoid the Omicron variant to go around? So, the, mm. so right here, you have so, something that was supposed to be, you know, sort of the best that China can offer, managed by Taiwanese, huge campus, enormous uh, workforce, ready to ramp up production, you know, as fast as you want. We'll hire 10,000 people a day, whatever, you know, we'll train them, we'll put, it, put them on your production. No problem, right? Mm -hmm. And this is fading spectacularly uh, because now it, when I look at that model, I see risk. Mm -hmm. I see a concentration of people. Of course, COVID is going to get into that. I mean, how can how can you not? So yeah. um, it's it's yeah. funny, isn't it? Because when we look at China's approach with COVID, I think initially probably people from outside of China, when COVID was raging around the world, not that it mm -hmm. still isn't, uh, it's it's still around, of course, but mm -hmm. when we were going through maybe the darkest times, hopefully with COVID, and mm -hmm. then you looked at China and they were like, hey, zero COVID here. And and maybe some people thought, oh, they're actually doing quite a good job. But it's, right. I think right. it's really swinging the other way now. And are we are we starting to get to, dare I say, Brexit levels of sort of like self-defeating you know, behavior with zero COVID. Right, right, right. Well, people have all kinds of theories about that. But yeah, it's a fact. Now they look really stuck in, in, in 2020. That's really mm. what it is right now. Japan has opened. Um, yeah. Taiwan has opened. You know, Hong Kong is is so afraid of losing everything to Singapore. They kind of force mm. themselves to open up closely, even though it's not fully, fully open, but there's no quarantine. Okay. So yeah. it, it's, there's still a little bit of restrictions. You have to wear the mask and so on, but you know, it's pretty open. I mean, you want to go, you go and you meet people and so on pretty fast and you, you don't need to, to waste any time on quarantine. So, um, I would say it's mostly open and you look at mainland China and uh, wow, you know, who else is as closed? I mean, you know, they're, neighbors in uh, in Pyongyang <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, really it's pretty um, it's pretty sad you know that's the image they're giving uh, mm. I, I won't go into the theories of you know why they do this and you know mm. they're, they're going to pursue this like sort of like the one child policy at one time you know invading people's privacy and uh, like what we consider the individual rights and everything mm -hmm. um and sort of galvanizing all the nation around this really tough goal and and, mm. and so on so that it is i'm not going to go into this to, to give a fair counterpoint i would say that most countries used covid politically for different reasons mm -hmm. uh not only china certainly not uh right. i think the western countries were all at it so we get a sense of the instability and the potential risk to disruption of supply chains. So then when you throw Chinese New Year into the mix, and that's mm -hmm. coming soon, then we're coming into potentially a tricky time for importers who are buying from China at the moment, because you've got the risk of COVID lockdowns, then you've got that enforced sort of disruption around CNY in mm -hmm. January. I guess the message from this particular episode, as you've said, is to just be ready and if you're not already ready <laughs> work on it immediately but i have a question mm -hmm. is there because this we we spoke about zero china a, a few episodes ago and mm -hmm. maybe that's not that realistic but china plus one or many is a way more realistic uh, approach for businesses who maybe at the moment are just buying from china for example mm -hmm. so if you know that Chinese New Year is coming up soon, would there be a scenario where you would, perhaps you've already got a supplier, say, in India, but they're not your dominant supplier, you're getting most of your product from China. Would you schedule your productions in such a way that you start scaling down your Chinese orders, you know, any time from now or October, bearing in mind that Chinese New Year is coming in January, 
And then you switch that production over to India, who are more likely to be working during Chinese New Year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for people who can afford that luxury and who have a backup supplier able to make the same products, uh, I'm pretty sure there's some companies doing exactly that. And you, you, you're right to take India as an example because if you take Vietnam, well, they have Tet. You know, it's mm. cut it whatever same you thing. want. It's it's Lunar New Year anyway. It's, it's at the same yeah. time. And it's um, it's also a major disruption to manufacturing. So mm. if you happen to be in the fortunate situation where you have maybe a main supplier in China, but you have a backup supplier in India capable that has demonstrated to be capable you know, of making the same model, same product, well, of course, you're going to look at the, the times when your Chinese supplier uh, is is busy look at the seasonality of their business and you're going to try to to work around that because if they are very busy around chinese new year before and after well you really want to avoid having them touch your products and ship anything to you at that time because before mm. cny they might be under a, an enormous amount of pressure to deliver and that means you know rush productions and you know, people who have to to stay up all night to uh, to get the container filled up and 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 shipped out. You 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 look at a lot of quality disasters, right? So it's not mm. just last minute. Oh, sorry, we cannot we really cannot complete it. Like I'm sorry, already half the workers are gone. We cannot you know chain them up to their workstation. You know they are gone. Like, we cannot finish the order now. We have to finish after CNY. You know, so that's a problem. But also. Sometimes you hear, hey, all done, good. Uh, we work really hard on it. And like, it's in the container. It's on the way to the port. It's done. We've done our job. Yeah, good job, you know. But maybe they really, they really mess things up. So that's why a lot of companies are doing more inspection before CNY than usual. Some companies have selected some suppliers and said, okay, like you can do self-inspections. And mm-hmm. and they let them do self inspections for most of the batches, uh, and sometimes they send an inspector just to to double check. But then, like for one month before CNY, uh, and, and maybe also just after CNY, they will actually send inspectors. There's no no more like self inspection because they know that the risk is just much higher, right? And after CNY also is a problem because who knows the turnover that they would have. Do they have proper staff training systems and everything? Uh, if you haven't validated that, then people are going to be, you know, trained on the job. Um, that mm. might not be fun. <laughs> no. You don't want to be the the training uh, training ground, right? So um, avoid it. Yeah. Can we just talk about the staff turnover for a moment? Because if you're thinking, well, we have you know a pretty long Christmas holiday in the West, in the States or in, in Europe, and all of my staff come back to work after the holiday. Yeah, they do. But it's not always the same in China. All right. No, they go back. So if it's local, local workers, they won't go very far away. But maybe maybe the wife is from whatever. Maybe the, the, the factory is in Koshan. And they have, you know, 90% of the stuff is local. Uh, some factories are like that. And yeah. but maybe the people, you know, maybe the wife is from Hunan. So maybe they, they go to Hunan and they come back. But there's a lot of migrant workers. For people who are not familiar with China, with places especially like Shenzhen, Donghua, you know, but also Ningbo, Wenzhou, uh, Suzhou. I mean, there's a lot mm-hmm. of migrant workers. And then these people, they don't tend to be very loyal. So they mm-hmm. they go... They pack their bags and everything. They go back and maybe their kids are still in the hometown, you know, taken care by the grandmother, let's say. They go back and then they talk, you know, the, the extended family. They, they keep moving from family to family, saying hi and everything, right? That's sort of what happens during Chinese New Year. And uh, and then they talk and they are so direct, you know, hey, how much you make? Oh, oh. Oh, you make about five thousand. Oh, I make six and a half thousand. You know, and for your kind of job, maybe you 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 would make seven thousand. Come to Ningbo. You know, stop going down to uh to 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 Zhongshan. What are you doing there? You know. Oh, really? And then like the parents are kind of proud if you earn more money and so on. There's there's a bigger 
pressure, you know, on your shoulders. So, okay, well, if I can make more money in Ningbo, I go to Ningbo, you know. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and that's it. And you you don't care, you know. You don't even, you know. You worked maybe a couple of years in that factory down there in Yongshan. Who cares, you know? I'm not even going to tell them. I don't care. Uh, yeah, they're going to try to call me and say, "Ah, oh, please come back. Oh, if you come back, you know, we give you 500 RMB right away the first day, blah, 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 blah. Oh, we can pay you a little bit more, you know, but no, no, I'm going to go to Ningbo. I'm going to see, and I'm going to get hired right away because I know they, 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 they lack workers like me. And I'm going to be introduced by this other guy and he's going to make a few thousand RMBs because he introduced me and I get hired, right? So everybody's happy. That's the way it works. So, of course, it varies a lot, but some factories have turnover rates at CNY of 25% and more, and it's really disruptive mm-hmm. because you're talking production assembly workers, you're talking inspectors, you're talking line leaders, you're talking people in the office, you're talking everything. Okay. Yep. Uh, it's very disruptive in these cases. But there's a lot of factories also where... Um, there's a good deal for the workers and the general atmosphere is not crazy and they, they get their days off regularly and they can do the number of hours they want. You know, they're happy with that. Let's say the pay is okay. They don't have to do an all-nighter or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some sense of, sense of structure. So in some factories, they're bouncing from crisis to crisis. Yeah. It, it's just crazy. It's just really wearing down on them wearing down on them but if if there is proper planning proper organization and everything that's fine you know they don't feel exhausted by that at the end of the week so mm. then you get uh you know more than 90 percent of the workers coming back and maybe some of them maybe it's better not to have 100 percent coming back because some of them you want to take advantage of cny to tell them eh, you know uh you know we kind of like you but you know you're you're not the best you know maybe Try to find another place. So 0% turnover might not be a good indicator, but uh, 40% is definitely very bad. Yeah. Right. So you've got that period of time heading up to Chinese New Year where you know factories are likely to be in a rush, standards can slip. That's mm-hmm. That's logical. Then you've got the break itself where potentially they're totally shut down. Then you've got that period after Chinese New Year when they're ramping back up, trying to cha- train new staff. And again, mm. we're talking about standards which are perhaps less than optimal there. So with this in mind then, and the fact that Chinese New Year coming up in 2023 is at uh, the end of January, around 22nd, when would you say is a safe time to start you know, sending orders back to your Chinese supplier? Um. I would say sending them an, an order is one thing, but you need to talk to them, give them forecast and, 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 and so on and so forth yeah. so that they, uh, they lock a certain period that makes sense for you, uh, mm. considering the risk. I mean, people don't all have their, the luxury of deciding when production is going to happen. Sometimes, they, you mm. know, sales are a bit brisker than they anticipated and they just have to get another production underway anyway. Right. So. It's about communicating and if risks are high, just monitoring more. I mean, mm. our, our QA, QC team gets very busy usually before CNY because the clients know that it's a high risk period and they, they want more more monitoring. That's just, um, that, that's just the way it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, a lot to think about there and a lot to bear in mind, given that Chinese New Year is coming up soon. So that's it. That's the annual reminder (laughs) uh, to to be careful. So um, if you're listening and you're wondering, well, Chinese New Year, uh, I'm a bit worried about the disruption this year. uh, Get in touch with us. Or if you know somebody that might be affected as well, we'll try and help any way we can. Right. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks for knowing. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks again for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Sophies Group. We're on a mission to provide you with everything you need to manufacture effectively in Asia, including inspections, auditing, new product development support, contract manufacturing, 3PL warehousing and fulfillment, and much, much more across Asia's key manufacturing areas. Visit us at sofeast.com. That's S-O-F-E-A-S-T.com to learn more and get help. 
If you've enjoyed the podcast today, please do rate, review and share because it will really help others discover us too.